Hello and welcome to the fifth Slush Pile Standouts video. My name is David Brown. I'm the founder of uh, Darling Axe Editing and Darling Indie, marketing for authors. So <clears throat> first of all, thanks very much to everyone who has contributed to this episode. So a number of authors have sent us the first pages of their manuscript. Um, and what's gonna happen is um, I'm gonna read these out uh, to two of our Darling Axe editors, Michelle Barker and Tara Gilboy. Um, and they're going to pretend like this is um, a writing contest and they're screening the entries. Um, so they're gonna tell me where to stop if something pulls them out of the story and then we'll discuss why that might be. Um, or maybe we'll get to the end of the page and they'll be ready to turn that page and keep on reading. Uh, so I'm gonna cut over right now to a Zoom video with Michelle and Tara and we'll jump right into it. All right, so welcome to Slush Pile Standouts Episode 5. I'm here with Michelle Barker and Tara Gilboy, and uh, we're going to jump right into it. So this one is for Michelle. Let me move my folder out of the way. There we go. Blood Wraith? You'd best whisper that name. They are to the nobility what the boogeyman is to children, only they're real. What proof have I? There's proof enough in the silence of those who used to speak their name aloud. If you don't believe me, try it yourself, but do so far from here. L.I. Aramos, 142nd. A man fled down the steeply sloping Injurin steps with nothing to mark his passage through those lonely crags, save the occasional brittle crunch of loose pebbles beneath his boots. He raced along the treacherous but unfamiliar route, cradling his right arm to his chest. He had lived the better part of his life in hiding, clinging to the night, a nameless, faceless wanderer, and this had kept him safe, altogether the bounties on his head. Though issued under many names and across cities, counties, and kingdoms, would put half of Midland's treasures to shame. Okay. Okay, that's, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop you there. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I liked the opening quote. I liked it a lot. In fact, uh, it drew me in right away. And I liked the first paragraph uh, for the most part. Um, I thought that there were some, um, there was some good sensory detail there. It was um, intriguing to me, uh, intriguing enough to me that it, it, it hooked me. But then everything shifts in that second paragraph. All of a sudden we, uh, we step away from the tension and we are in backstory. And I don't think that that is uh, a good strategy. I feel like all the gains that you've made in that first paragraph um, are lost by the second paragraph because you're giving us information that we really don't need yet. Um, now to pick apart the, the, the bits that you read, um, I would really watch for unnecessary redundancies, um, the brittle crunch of loose pebbles there's five words there where there probably only need to be three. Um, a crunch is brittle and pebbles are loose. So these are things that we don't, we don't need to know. Um, steeply sloping is another one. Just say that it's steep. I don't, you, you know, like, I just think that it, it's overwritten for, for no reason. Um, and I also wonder why this man is not named right from the beginning. I don't, I don't see uh, a virtue to holding back his name until the very end of this page. Um, I think you can still use that sentence in the end where you're sort of um, emphasizing that he's one of the blood wraiths. That's great. Um, but call him Bale right from the beginning. I just don't see the point of, of saying a man, um, e even though he's like nameless and faceless to other people, but he surely knows who he is. So I don't, I, I just, I just felt that that was sort of unnecessary. Um, um, oh yeah, one other thing to point out that we, did, we didn't get to this point, but the empty stare in his eyes is a point of view um, slip because he cannot see his eyes, so um, you, can't, you can't use that. Um, presuming that this is in his point of view, uh, at which I am presuming um, without knowing any better. So I don't know, uh, that's what I have to say about it. I don't know if you guys have anything that you want to add. Yeah, I, I agree with what you said. And I think that, you know, you mentioned two things I think that were my biggest stumbling blocks with this was that um, I felt like so the point of view is a little bit muddled. Um, I mean, even the fact that he's just called a man to me is a point of view slip because, you know, he knows who he is. And if we're in his point of view, I feel like we should know who he is too, right? It's like, it, it's not the kind of suspense and questions I think that you want to be, you know, creating for the reader um, at 
this at this point um you that's not you know true suspense you want the reader to to get that suspense and to want to keep reading to find out what's going to happen in the story you know not just to finally find out what the man's name is um so yeah I mean I, I'm interested in the story um I think that it's it's off to a good start but I want more of that rooting detail and I'd want those kind of point of view things fixed you know before I'd be willing to keep reading so mm -hmm. <clears throat> Um, yeah, I would I would echo both of you in a lot of that. Um, I wasn't I, I was a little bit on the fence with the point of view um, because I mean we have this running man fighting to control a black fear welling up inside him, and that does that does say deep third to me. Um, but I am I guess still open to the possibility that that the story is omniscient, or at least the the prologue is omniscient, and this is like. Uh, like a godlike narrator, or this is someone who can see that fear in his heart. But um, I mean, as as all three of us are editors, we know that that's something that we usually see, and it, it doesn't end up working out that way. So, so that's something I, I'm also wondering about from the start. But I wasn't as certain um, if it was going to be uh, like a yeah. I, I thought maybe this would be an omniscient prologue kind of a thing. Anything else there? Um. <clears throat> I don't think so. I just felt like, you know, that second paragraph, um, it's information that we probably are going to need at some point, but you don't want to be putting that on page one and, or, or if this is a prologue, I don't, I, I didn't, I didn't know that it might be a prologue and I guess it could be. Um, but I still felt like it, it's, it's taking a step away when you don't want to step away, you know, like he's, uh, there's all this tension. This guy is running down the stairs. He's in this, you know, unfamiliar route. His, his arm is, is, is hurt, obviously. Um, like stay with it, right? Like I was, that that was great, great action, great tension. Don't take a step away from that. That's, that was my feeling. So yeah, that's, that's why I, that was why I stopped you basically. So. <clears throat> yeah, I agree. Okay, Tara, are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Share the screen again here. Okay. So the bearded man was staring at her not watching, staring. Katie felt the hair on the back of her neck raise, and she ran her hands over her skirt to soothe herself. She looked back to the man and shook her head. He had turned away. Of course, he hadn't been staring. It was just nerves. Thank you, Sean, the announcer's voice came through the speakers. Our next performer is Catherine Thompson, a freshman from Nashville Christian Academy. Katie took a deep breath and released it slowly, crossing the stage, her eyes strained to see the crowd, but all she could make out was a sea of darkness. <clears throat> the heat from the lights threatened to suffocate her. As she bowed, a roar of applause thundered from the audience. Warmth flooded her cheeks. Breathe, she whispered as she rounded the piano bench. After taking her seat, she placed a camera on the edge of the music rack and pointed it toward the scale. She glanced to stage left. There he was again, running his fingers over his neatly trimmed beard. Why was he staring like that? He's not staring, she said to her. She whispered to herself. He's watching. Everyone is. Katie shoved the man from her mind and found her place on the scale. Katie pressed her fingers into the ivory and the concert hall filled with the sweet sound. How many hours had she spent practicing this song? A thousand? Her fingers danced across the keys. The notes reverberated off the walls. Well, as you can see, I let you go through the whole page on this one um, because I really liked this. I really liked this first page. I thought that it was a really good mix of, you know, action and really rooting us in that moment there with her. And then that suspense, because I think, you know, the whole time we're there with Katie, uh, we're wondering about that bearded man and what kind of threat that he poses and what's going to happen. Um, there were some things that I would watch on this. Um, there were a couple moments where I thought, you know, maybe there were things that were a little bit repetitive that could be trimmed. Um, and I wanted to know, I think a little bit, you know, just a little bit more especially at the beginning of like where the man is in relation to Katie um some more of those kind of details and, and we do kind of find that out later um but but I, I would like those you know up front in that first paragraph you know to know kind of what's going on a little bit more but and at the same time I just I thought it was such a nice mix of really staying in the scene they're not going into backstory right away um they're just letting us be there with Katie at her uh, at her performance and and then also that tension between the, the bearded man who's kind of creeping her out so I'm curious to hear what you guys uh think but I, I really like this one 
Yeah, I'm, I, I liked it. I did have some issues with it, though. I was, I was quite confused about where the bearded man was. I found that um, because if, if she was in the audience and saw him, and then all of a sudden she's on the stage and he's now at stage left or where, like, I, I just couldn't figure out how does he keep appearing and how can she see him? I was quite, I was a little bit confused about, about where he was. And I was also sort of, I was on the fence in terms of, of whether this was a, a non-issue or not, because like she's performing. So obviously people are going to be watching the performance. So, and I, and she does bring it up. He's not staring, he's watching, but then I'm thinking, yeah, okay, exactly. So is there a problem? Like I, I don't know. I was, I, I was a little bit, I, it, 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 it made me think a little bit about it. But, but the thing that bothered me more than anything actually is that I felt like this is somebody who's never played piano before. Um, and there were like some of the, the, the words that she used didn't make like she pointed it towards the scale. I don't even like, I, I think she means keyboard. Um, but like the, the moments like that, like take me out of the story immediately. And then, and then how many hours had she spent practicing this song? You wouldn't call it a song, you would call it a piece. Um, and these are maybe very small details, but the thing is if anybody were to pick this up who actually plays piano, they would probably put it down right away because it, it's not right. Um, so, so that, I, I, that bothered me. Okay. Um, I don't know yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I was also confused about what the scale was. Um, and, and I didn't, I didn't even get that it meant the keyboard. I thought it was like, there was like actually like a way scale or something on the piano. And I was like, I don't know what, what that's doing there. Um, and, and yeah, I had a similar thing where I didn't know where she was in relation to this man. And then she's on the stage and then it did seem like, oh, but okay, she's a performer. And if he knows that she's a performer, like it, it would make more sense as to why he would be staring. But then also she gets up and she can't see the audience because the lights yeah. are so bright, but then she can see him. So is he exactly. on the stage? Or I, thought he, he... I thought he must be, but, I, but I, was also, I was having the exact same reaction. It's like, wait, she can't see anybody, but she can see him. So where is he? But yeah, yeah. If he's on the stage. That's really creepy. But it also like I don't think he's on the stage. Um, and like yeah, what's everybody else think if this random guy is just crawled up on stage? I don't know. Yeah, well that's it, right? Like if he wasn't like where was he before, right? If she was in the audience, where if, she, if he's off the stage on stage left, which I'm presuming is like like not not actually on the stage, she wouldn't have been able to see him. I don't think, right? But then she can see him when she's on stage. I don't know. There, there's confusion there. That and this is page one, right? And you you definitely don't want your reader to be confused on page one. So, and it, maybe it's a matter of um, we need more specification exactly where she's standing in that first paragraph. Because you said that you thought she was in the audience, and I thought that she was like on stage or just kind of waiting off in the wings for her to be called. Uh, and so I think that since we're both assuming different things, I'm looking and they never actually say. Um, so that's probably part of the problem, I think. Right. Yeah, that would be that would that would help to have that clarity for sure. But yeah, I, I agree with Tara that, that it, it, it's nice to have a first page that stays in scene. Um, mm -hmm. I, like I often tell clients, your, your first goal is tran to transport readers into this time and place. Um, <clears throat> and, and yeah, that's, that's happening here, even though there's, there's some clarity issues. Mm -hmm. And there's some nice uh, sensory detail in there as well, I thought, you know, the, the heat from the lights, and then she's looking out into the audience and all she sees is darkness. Like that, that's, that's all, that all felt very real, so. Yeah, and I think a good, like you had mentioned, um, uh, that it not really feeling true to piano performance. And a good thing like that I would probably give a suggestion to if I was editing this would be to do some interviews with people who play piano and perform. And, and that's kind of where that kind of research comes in. Even in fiction, you can talk to people who perform regularly. Definitely, yeah, yeah. Cool, all right. Okay, Michelle, back to you. <clears throat> the sound of pickaxes striking the dark tunnel walls drowns out my stomach's rumbling, but hunger still twists my gut. I never get enough to eat. I sigh and scrape more chunks of basalt into a dented bucket. Goblin's small size lets us fit into tight spaces, and that, along with our night vision and iron-hard claws, makes us excellent miners. Not that we want to be. Forty of us from 12-year-olds like me to graying 100-year-olds like Coprinus form a mining platoon. Three Ogren 
eight feet tall and half as wide supervise us, meaning they use clubs and whips to force us to mine gold for little food and no pay, unless insults, punches, and whip scars count as pay. I hate Og Ogren. They're ugly, dumb, and mean. <clears throat> That's where I'm gonna stop you. Okay. Um, I like the idea of this. I think there's also, again, some good sensory detail that brings us into scene, the sound of the pickaxes, the hunger, um, all, all those sorts of things. However, uh, this is basically telling. Um, you've got, you know, they've got their night visions, they've got their iron hard claws, uh, they can fit into tight spaces. The, the, the author is telling us these things rather than showing them to us. Rather, like, why not have a scene where, where they are in a tight space, it is dark, so they're using their night vision and they're using their iron hard claws. And then furthermore, why not have these um, supervisors using their clubs and their whips and whatever, and, and their insults and punches so that we see these things happening rather than being told that they happen. Um, and that, that, I mean, that is my main, my main uh, concern with this is that, if the, if the author were to bring this to life and turn it into a scene, I think it would be great. Um, I'm, I'm very engaged with, with the details here. I just don't want to be told the details. I want to be shown them. Um, further on on, uh, on this page, um, we get into backstory, which is something that I don't think should be on page one of a novel ever. Um, so I would, I would recommend against that. Yeah, I, I agree. I have the same um, same thoughts as you. I uh, I really love the concept of this, and I'm just a fan of middle grade. Anyways, um, it's one of my favorite genres to read. And here we have this twelve year old. Um, but I, I love the concept and the idea of it. But again, like you said, it's just that there's a lot of telling. I wanted to see them be using the clubs. I want to see them working. I want to see them being hungry. You know, not told. Um, and then, um, you know, for things like that, they're, I hate ogre and they're ugly, dumb and mean, you know, if that was shown, if, if all those other things were shown to us and seen, you can trim away a lot of that because we're going to see it and know it. We don't need to be told. Um, exactly. the only other thing that I noticed, um, is that there's the, the thoughts, um, are italicized, which is kind of a pet peeve of mine. Um, just cause we're in this point of view, we don't need all of the, the thoughts, um, italicized. I know some people do that, but that's just kind of a pet peeve of mine. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And, and that um, pulled me out right at the, right at the second line there. Um, italic thoughts in first person just doesn't really make sense to me. And I, I think it's not even necessary in, thir in a deep third person. Um, and then when you do have those direct thoughts, um, I, I feel like they should advance the plot or develop character and not just kind of tell the reader things. I think it's, it's a, a convenience to just drop, drop things in like that and conveniences generally you know, readers are going to snag on and, and get pulled out of the story. And in that first one, for example, hunger still twists my gut. I never get enough to eat. You don't need to say that you never get enough to eat because hunger's twisting your gut. We've already got that. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I feel like when you do use direct thoughts, they should really be um, developing the character as much as possible rather than just stating something that's it's already obvious by the rest of the exposition. I almost wonder if a sentence like that, I never get enough to eat, is sort of an attempt at a scene. Um, but it's not, but it isn't a scene. Do you know what I mean? Like that the author was sort of trying to, trying to bring the reader into the moment, um, but just not, not going far enough, you know? I, I don't know. Um, it really, but, it, it, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to think you kind of jumping on that because I've noticed something that I'll see that a lot when I'm reading early drafts of rehab, these things where the authors, you know, will write and they, they know what they need, but they almost kind of become like these placeholders for scenes, right? Um, as you're writing those early drafts, you're kind of giving summaries and trying to, to figure out, you know, letting the story kind of evolve and kind of figure out what the story is that you're telling. And then when you go back and do your third and fourth draft, that's when you can start choosing those moments and writing them out as scenes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Share the next screen here. Okay, back to Tara. So we had a bearded man and now we have a giant man. The giant man stands motionless on the scaffolding as rope is slung around his neck and secured tightly. He stares over the heads of the clamoring crowd with unseeing eyes. They scream their hatred at him. The crowd has a unique smell. Sweat, yes, but more. It is an angry, lactic smell. 
not old sweat, but sweat being produced there and then in the heat of the moment, cultivating from the clenching of muscles, the closeness of bodies, from a fever produced in the part of the brain that hates. The air amongst them is steeped in it. There is a young woman who shouts for her beaten and violated sister, wherever she is now, for her parents who, over the years, deflated before her eyes, for a life in which- I'll stop you right there. Okay. Um, I, the reason I, I stopped you and I was kind of waiting to see, you know, if it would get um, a little bit more straightened out with that point of view, but I, I feel like uh, right now we're already in, you know, the fourth paragraph and I feel like I'm kind of watching something on television um, more so than I feel like I'm reading a novel, if that makes any sense, because I feel like I don't know whose point of view I'm in. Um, I'm just observing, you know, a giant man. I'm observing a woman. I'm observing the smell, but I haven't gotten anybody's thoughts or anything about what it means and since I don't know whose point of view I'm in I don't know who my who I'm rooting for and I just don't feel like I'm engaged in the scene you know I want to know who's whose head I'm in um and I think that's you know a lot of times um I think I'll see that um in, in novels and it's you know people can kind of forget sometimes I think that that novels are are different than television are different than plays because they're the one form where we get to get inside, you know, people's heads and get inside that point of view. And I, I think that we, we need to remember to do that as, as novelists. So um, that was kind of, that was why I stopped. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. As, as soon as the young woman, uh, we, we start the, the paragraph with the young woman, I got quite confused about point of view as well. Um, but I also wondered, I mean, there's this, there would have been a, a very simple fix for at least part of that is, and that would have been to use dialogue. Um, you know, this is, a, the, he's, the author is telling about, well, she shouts for the clothes, she shouts for this, she's shouting for that. Well, why not have her actually say these things out loud? Um, but again, I would, I would want to, I assumed because the story started with the giant man that we were going to be in his point of view. But then um, I, I, de I definitely, yeah, by the time the young woman came around, I was confused. Um, but yeah, so putting it in dialogue what would help. One thing I did want to say though is that the paragraph about the smell I thought was really, really good. That the the, the sweat and the different types of sweat, I thought that was very um, a very interesting observation. Um, and I was assuming, I guess, at, still at that point, that it was an observation of the giant man who's who's standing there and obviously must be must be afraid, I guess. Uh, although I suppose we're not ever told. Um, yeah, but the, no, I, I, the point of view is, is I think, the main, the main issue there. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, yeah, I'm going to say much the same thing. Uh, I did really like that sentence. That was another thing I noted, not the old sweat, but sweat being produced there and then in the heat of the moment. I thought that was awesome. Um, but yeah, I, I, I could be open. Like, I don't necessarily need a clear point of view on the first page. Like, this could be... Now, obviously, that's not what's on on the page here. But like, I, like for example, if you have this scene and the POV is from like let's say a prince standing on a balcony over on the other side of the crowd, kind of watching all this go down. I don't need to know that is the prince, but just being just just having this dictated from that perspective is going to give it a sense of perspective and and like a fixed point of view, uh, without even knowing like who the character is behind that. Um, and and I think that that could be accomplished with voice, but here you've got this guy and he's 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 staring over the the crowd um and with unseeing eyes and i feel like that's kind of edging into his head a little bit um and then there's the smell feels like very omniscient or that there's there's yeah like i i wasn't sure w where the smell could be pinned down to and then there's this young woman okay so now this young woman has to have some some claim on the point of view right um but yeah it's it's still not certain and then on top of it, that paragraph about the young woman, it's like, it's all over the place. So we've got, okay, she's shouting for her beaten and violated sister. My first conclusion is that's the giant man did this to her sister, like specifically. But then she's like upset about her, her parents who are deflated before her eyes and, and other, like, and there's all this other stuff going on. I'm not available to, to get um, clothes and shoes. Um, and so then it's like, there's a lot being, being put upon this guy and I don't really know what's going on anymore. And I don't know why this young woman is, is mad about all these different things and, and, and that this guy is the target of it. So by that point, I was, I was pretty confused about what was going on. And, and, um, and then, sorry, I'm going to mention one more snag, which was just that 
the, the scaffolding rope is slung around his neck and secured tightly. And then down the page, the noose is pulled taut. And so I, was, I just kind of like, I already kind of thought about the, the rope being slung around his neck and secured. And then tightly adds adds that adverbs or really make sure we know that it's tight and then it's it's pulled taut again down the page. So at that point I was kind of like, okay, um, that was this that was just another snag for me. I sort of felt like that young woman that that young woman um, paragraph it, it could be made to work. Like I could see somebody whose uh, like sister was was murdered. Um, basically, her whole her, it sounds like her whole childhood was was ruined as a result, which, which makes sense. And so I could see her projecting all of this onto this man, like, you know, everything is his fault, not just the fact that the sister was beaten, but also, you know, she didn't have any clothes or what, I mean, all the things that she lists here, it's all going to be his fault. But it, if that's going to happen, I feel like it needs to be approached in a different way. Like, I feel like then we are, then we really probably should be in that woman's point of view, um, where we feel her, her anger and, and, and understand that she's maybe being unreasonable, that she's, you know, blaming him for things that he couldn't possibly be responsible for. Um, so I feel like it could work, but it's not working the way it, it stands right now. And that, that kind of speaks to what, you know, we were saying, if you need that clear point of view, like you said, even if it was just like a prince watching from far off and that will affect the way that it's seen. Cause if we, you would like put her, you know, it's summarized right now, but if we did see that dialogue, then whatever that filtering point of view is, is going to kind of reflect on like, oh, you know, they could understand where, how she would feel that way, or, you know, she's blaming him, you know, and, and that would affect that too, that, that point of view. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Some dialogue there could be really good. Oh, one little nitpicky thing I forgot to mention. I was going to, um, that, that paragraph about the woman too, it starts with, there is a young woman who shouts. Um, and you could just say a young woman shouts. I always say don't start sentences with, with forms of to be. So, you know, now, I, now when I'm writing and I start a sentence with there is, I think of you, Tara. <laughs> <laughs> Come up before, that's awesome. And I change it. <laughs> <laughs> I still write them too. I'm always nitpicky about it, but all my first drafts start with lots of there is. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So back to Michelle. Is that right? Yes. Yep. <clears throat> so this trip to Pemberley was like no other. Elizabeth had traveled alone from Los Angeles, no parents, brother, or ex. Her luggage was lost, although the airlines used other words. She waited in London, gave up on her luggage, and took the bus to Lambton. Aunt Jane came from Pemberley to pick her up. It was always great to be together. The Darcys gathered in the kitchen, the warmest room. It had been remodeled in the 70s, and a wall to a servant's room removed, so there could also be a sitting area. Fortunately, Aunt Jane had resisted the flower power wallpaper and shag rug. There was a lot of catching up to do, talking over each other mostly, um, talking over each other mostly stories related to the Darcy's of Pemberley movie. While they talked and drank, Elizabeth could feel the knots in her shoulders loosen. Of course, she had no way of knowing that would be the last, that would be the last night in her world. Okay, I'm going to stop you there. Um, I have a, a number of things to, to pick on here. Um, I like, first of all, I, I want to say I like the details of things like flower power wallpaper and shag rug. I think those are, that, that's sharp observation. And I think that's good. And I also love the, the, the her luggage was lost, although the airlines used other words, because of course they do. Um, but I think this, this opening paragraph is problematic. First of all, I'm quite confused about all of these references to Pride and Prejudice. I, I don't know what I'm reading. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if it's fan fiction. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what it is, and I'm confused by it. Um, it. It takes me in directions that I just don't really. I don't really know what to make of it. Now, that's something that probably, if this was actually a book, and I picked it up and looked on the back cover, I wouldn't maybe have that confusion. Um, but just responding to a cold like this, I do. Um, but the reason really why I, I stopped, two, two things that really stood out for me. First of all, I think there's way too much being packed into this opening paragraph. Uh, it's all telling. It's quite generalized. Things like it was always great to be together. 
I don't, I don't know what that means. I don't know what that looks like. Do they, are they talking? Do they, are they sitting around drinking? I mean, what are they doing? I, what is, I, and, and all, there was lots of catching up to do, talking over each other, mostly stories related to the Darcy's of, of Pemberley movie. It's a lot of stuff packed in there. And I think it needs, all of these things need breathing room. They need to be sort of unpacked, opened up. Let us see what this actually looks like when they get together. Um, you know, let us see the reunion of it. She's coming, she's seeing Aunt Jane. If it's great to be together, I wanna see, I wanna see what that looks like. But the thing that I think that really bothered me was that last sentence. Of course, she had no way of knowing that would be the last night in her world. Those sentences are a pet peeve of mine because basically what they are is manufactured tension. Um, basically all it's saying is she had no way of knowing that something was gonna happen. Um, and it's, it's a way of creating tension that does not work for me because it's not real tension. Um, so I, anytime I see a sentence like that, I get upset. <laughs> so that's, that's why I stopped it. Um, I, I think that as the, as the page progresses, there's lots of great sensory detail in there. Um, you know, that the, the darkness of the room, the heaviness with the lace curtains, the, the feeling of the, um, carpet on her feet and all of those things. I like that. I think that really brings us into the moment. Um, but I just think that there needs to be um, less telling, more showing, more unpacking of these generalizations because generalizations really don't work for a reader. We can't, we can't enter into a generalized statement. We need things to be specific. Yeah, I agree. Especially on that first page, I think it's just so important to stay in scene the whole time and make sure that you've really rooted your reader um, in the time and place of where they are in the dialogue. I would suggest starting this, um, although I have to say I'm a huge Pride and Prejudice fan, and so I love this premise and this idea. I think this is awesome. But um, I, I would suggest, I think, starting this page with the Darcy's gathered in the kitchen, the warmest room. It had been remodeled in the seventies because I think that will put it, put us right in the scene right away. We know where we are. We're in this room. Um, and then we could go into dialogue, you know, instead of all this summary, like somebody can say, well, what'd you think of the Darcy's of Pemberley movie, you know, and then exactly. they can talk about it. Um, and then we can really get a sense, you know, of not only of like what's happening, which is what this page is trying to do, I think is kind of set up what's happening, but who these people are, right? Like we can get to know them through the way that they interact with each other. And I think those kind of like family dinner scenes are some of the most powerful scenes that you can use to establish character. And so I think it's really kind of a wasted opportunity to, to do that because I think that, that here by seeing them interact with one another, we can really get to know Elizabeth, you know, much better. Um, so. Yeah. Well, the other thing, too, is that if this is the last night in her world, we want to know what's at stake, right? So we, we should really, that, that last night in her world needs to be dramatized so that we know what she's losing, if, if, if that's what's, that's what's going to happen, right? So, so all the more reason to develop, you know, unpack that, that first paragraph, develop that moment, and let us see who these people are, and let us see if this is her last night in the world, like, you know, what's, what she's going to be missing. Yeah. Um... I, so, yeah, I kind of, I, I, I started out with, with very similar feelings, but by the end of the page, I was, I was definitely more interested and, and I started to think, okay, maybe there's some time travel going on here and that, okay, I'm now I'm intrigued. Um, I, I wanted to see this time travel, but for me, the, the first snag was the first sentence. This trip to Pemberley was like no other. I'm like, okay, tell me like, how is this like no other, like, I want to know about this trip that was like no other, but uh, she just had a, a trip and they lost her luggage. And so right away, I was like, it was like no other. What, like, how, <laughs> how is this so momentous? She, they lost her luggage, that sucks. But so kind of right away, I started thinking um, rather than being drawn into the story. And yeah, absolutely. Um, so what Michelle was saying about, about this being summary, I often refer to this as, as narrative summary, um, this, this kind of writing mode. Um, and it is useful for scene transitions. It, it is helpful once in a while to, to speed up time and go into a summary to get a character to a different place to gloss over a couple things, but it's definitely not helpful on your first page. Um, and then when I got to that line, um, she had no way of knowing that this would be the last night in her world. I was, first of all, I was a bit confused. What does that mean in her world? Because I didn't click based on what came before, I didn't click time travel yet, if that's actually where this is going. Um, but then that kind of brought me back to that first, this the tri trip to Pemberley was like no other. And then this is the last night in her world. I'm getting these like big statements, but mm -hmm. I, I don't know if there's, and at this point, I don't know if there's gonna be the follow through. 
Um, and so kind of my thinking for this was why not? Um, I, by the way, I really like the idea of starting with a dinner party, um, starting with a little bit more concrete stasis, like a slice of normal life, even if it's, if it's normal life in a, in a, in, in a new place that you've just transitioned to or going home, whatever. Um, and then, and then going like building up a little bit more, maybe even with a hint that something's changed or something weird's happening, um, to move into the time travel or just start in the time travel. Um, although the problem there is like having a character wake up and that's when the, the time travel has happened because starting a, you know, starting a novel with a character waking up, um, isn't necessarily going to snag with all readers, but with, um, agents, editors, publishers, it's, it's going to be very, very difficult to have that fly because it's just such a common way. Um, so here we have a character starting uh, the, the novel by waking up in, in potentially a time travel scenario. So even though that's not the first line, I do still feel like we're, we're starting waking up and, and I just, yeah, I have trouble with that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's easily solved. I think if, if they uh, have this, this dinner, each other and and you know interaction and and we see these characters and all of that like it i i think that will that that'll make the, the the moment that she wakes up the next morning with this feeling of terrible jet lag which i'm suspecting is maybe not actually jet lag it's you know something else um like i think then that will that that could work um it just it just needs a couple of pages you know of of uh and also i think it's important when you're if you're going to use stasis um that there has to still be tension in there. Um, I don't think that like, like just a dinner party with like everybody getting along and nothing really happening is not going to hook the reader. Um, I think you want to have a dinner party where maybe she assumes they're all going to get along and then in fact they don't, you know, or there's something is going on that she's, you know, not happy about or whatever. I mean, I don't, you, you have to sort of inject something else in there that's going to, that's going to make your reader interested and want to know more about what's going on. And then of course, if she gets, um, you know, transported out of there, leaving this world that has a problem in it, that's going to, you know, make it even more, um, you know, uh, necessary for her to get back or she'll want to get back. So mm -hmm. like you were saying great. before, um, you had mentioned before about, um, you know, knowing what's kind of at stake for her in this world when she when she gets out of it. And, and when you were just mentioning that now, um, that tension, I was kind of thinking, she, you know, you could even use that even if she, it's like, oh, she has some sort of secret, you know, that she doesn't want her family to find out about. Um, yeah. And then just one other thing I want to comment to just because it's something I, I know I always struggle with. If there's any sort of magic, you always want to hint at that in the first like few pages at least so it doesn't come out of yeah. the blue so if yeah. we're not going to get those hints of it um I think that we need to her to see something or something needs to be off or even if it's just you know something kind of shimmery to use like probably a really cliche example of how you could do it but just something to hint that there's there's magic or time travel coming so. yeah sure. I agree I agree yeah all right Okay, I, we are at the last one. So back to Tara. Okay. <clears throat> Kate slipped into her past with the ease of turning a page. The present with its clamoring tangle of endless demands floated away on glittering dust motes spinning on the slat of light that fell across the small attic. She held the moment between her thumb and index finger one faded photograph she had long forgotten about, the scent of the past hidden under a layer of mothballs, dust, and tired leather. It had been the first term of her second year at university. Sunday okay, I'm stopping you right there. Um, and the reason I'm stopping you is because we went into, even though there's some lovely writing here, the, the reason I'm stopping is because we went into a flashback without knowing anything about what's going on in the present moment. Um, and this is something that I, I see all the time um, when I'm editing and when I'm teaching. Um, you don't ever want to have a flashback on your first page. Um, we need to know who the characters are now, what the characters are, are doing right now. Um, if you do, I think if people do feel the need to go into a flashback, um, it should just be handled that that's where you need to start your story. And that's the present moment where your story starts, you know, or work it in in a later chapter. Um, I also felt like there were a lot of um, things going on in that Oh, lost sound on you there, Tara. Mm -hmm. No, still can't hear you. Try. Oh. Oh. Now can you hear me? Yeah. 
Okay. Um, I was going to say also in that first paragraph, I felt like some of the details were a little um, vague um, and just, you know, a lot of, you know, there were some some lovely little turns of phrase, but not necessarily any like concrete imagery. So um, I would have wanted to see, I think, more of that. Just more to root me in that moment um, instead of just leading up to the flashbacks. Yeah, I actually, I, I mean, I got nervous after the first sentence, to be honest. As soon as I hear she's slipping into her past, I thought, oh, no, 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 no. We don't want to do that. Not right away. We need to know who she is. We need to have some present moment first. Um, and then when I realized, yeah, this basically this whole first page was flashback. Um, no, it's just, that's just something that you do not want to do at the beginning of a novel. You have to establish uh, the present moment before you start moving around in the past. And I, I really have to say that flashback, I mean, I've, I've heard from some people that you want to avoid flashback, even for maybe the first 50 pages or so, like, but you know, don't, we, we don't need the backstory right away. I, I know that um, authors seem quite nervous about the idea that readers aren't going to know what's going on if they don't have a certain amount of information. But I think that readers need a lot less information than we think they do. And it also, I think, takes away the process of discovery. Like, you know, allow us to wonder, you know, allow us to, allow there to be some mystery in the story um, without handing us the answers right at the beginning, uh, because that, you do our work for us and then it's, it's a lot less fun to read it. I think that first sentence would be awesome for, I, I'm just stuck on time travel. <laughs> for a time travel novel, she slipped into her past with the ease of turning a page. And now it's 1945. <laughs> and then she, I, don't know. Um, but, uh, I just wanted to mention that she held the moment between her thumb and index finger. I thought that's beautiful. Um, and, and especially that it's a photograph. I, I think that worked really well. But yeah, um, as soon as it drops into backstory yeah same same thing for me um but yeah some really nice writing uh throughout it um yeah there's there's definitely some some good good language going on here um but yeah i want to start with like michelle was saying um readers don't need all of this information um you know it's it's great to have some mystery i think like all the information that readers need is what's happening right now What's going on? Where is this person? What's around them? What are they doing? That's the information that readers need at all times. Readers should never be confused about what's actually happening in a scene. Um, and then everything else, all the context, doesn't matter as much. Readers will figure that out as they go along. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you can have, and the thing is that you can create these little mysteries. If Kate has, you know, she's, you know, Daryl is the, the one that got away or whatever, and she's, she's still sort of thinking about him. I mean, you can have her in a present moment scene at dinner or something where she's like, you know, looking off into space and, and her husband is like, you know, what are you thinking about? And, and she you know, doesn't say anything and without even yet explaining what's going on. Like, we don't need to know yet. All we, and it creates intrigue. Like we're, we're interested. She, obviously she's not paying attention to what's going on with her family. She's thinking about something else. What is she thinking about? We want to know, right? So I, I feel like when you don't give the answers right away, you actually, you, you're creating this, this tension that the reader wants to find out, like, what is, what's going on with this person? Why, you know? And, and we want to read on to, to, to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is so like describe her looking at the photograph, describe the photograph, um, but don't right away come out and, and tell readers exactly what it all means to her. Mm -hmm. I remember um, when I was, um, we were doing our MFA at UBC, uh, one of our teachers, Gail, had given some advice about flashback, which is basically the same as you said, Michelle. Um, and the one caveat, which if people would say, but no, the reader absolutely needs this information. They have to have it. You know, her thing was always like, okay, well then maybe that's where you need to start your story. Maybe that's the opening scene of your story. It shouldn't be a yeah. flashback then, you know, because you can't write your whole novel in flashbacks, um, which is surprisingly very tempting to do sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I just think that in general, like, I mean, flashback is just dangerous no matter what, because the, no matter what you do, with it it's something that's already happened so you're never going to really be able to spice it up that much because it's done it's, it doesn't hold the same immediacy it doesn't hold the same tension as present moment scene and so you're you're never going to make something as good in flashback as you can when you're writing in present moment so flashback is something i feel like it's it's a very dangerous tool it, it you, you want to only use it when you absolutely need to and and really like as, in my opinion anyways as sparingly as possible mm. I, I actually uh, a couple books I've read this year um, and of course I'm going to completely forget the names of them right now 
Um, but both had both had a uh, very interesting use of flashback where it was entirely relationship based, but it still was, it wasn't like a present moment. And then the person thinking about what happened before it actually was like a full shift where the next chapter takes place in the past, doesn't have any significant bearing on the story, but was about the relationships that are relevant in the story and was like these flashbacks that moved into these like full mm -hmm. scenes from the past where the relationship between characters is explored. Um, and I think that can, that can work really well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That almost sounds, yeah, more like a shifting timeline. Yeah, yeah, it does, yeah, yeah. yeah. Although I will say one thing that was kind of funny for people who are writing, you know, middle grade or, or kids books. I had a kid one time when I used to substitute teach who was reading a novel that had a flashback and he was laughing and laughing and laughing because he thought that the publisher had put the pages in, in the wrong order. <laughs> <laughs> he thought he had got one over on them. And I was like, oh, flashback. <laughs> it's okay. That's great. <laughs> Cool. Well, that's all we have for today. Um, uh, we do have a couple more submissions um, that have come in that are lined up. Um, so I'll, I'll put out another call and maybe once we have, we're up to another six, we can do this again. Sounds good. It's fun. Always yeah. fun. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you both very much. And uh, yeah, talk to you again soon. Yeah. Awesome. Good night. Good night. Good night.